morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service. We're just on time, so we will get started. Thank you very much for joining us for our evening teaching service. I've got a couple of announcements here. First of all, the offerings today are for the ministry of the gospel to support those with material needs. And offerings can be given during the collection or online uh, by e-transfer. The Blessings Church Council has accepted a proposal to extend a call to Reverend Winston Bosch to serve as a pastor of the Streetlight Congregation. So Blessings is the sending church for Streetlight. They have oversight over this church here. Uh, so they were able to make some of these kind of decisions. Uh, so the congregation here is invited to a congregational meeting on Wednesday, July 13th to register a vote on this proposal. And that meeting will be at the Blessings Christian Church, which is 115 Stanley, Stanley Avenue. Um, so that's going to be not next week, but the week after. So you'll want to pay attention to that. If you want to be involved in that vote, you're going to want to show up on July 13th to Blessings Church uh, to participate in that. Yeah, good point. I don't have, have a time here. My guess is it's 7.30, because that's usually when they do these kinds of things. But uh, we'll make sure for next week in the bulletin, it's, there's a time. Yeah, Cheryl? Uh, that's another good question. Possibly. It's, it's quite possible. So I'll, I'll check into those couple things this week, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find that stuff out. The bus and the time. Uh, there will also be no adult Bible study in July and August due to summer holidays, but that will resume again in September. And there will be no nurseries or kids' corner in the morning service uh, during the summer as well because of holidays. Uh, so that will kick off again in September as well. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 105, verse 1 to 3. Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let's stand. And together we confess. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's sing together from Come, Let Us Worship and Bow Down, songbook number 17. We'll sing through it twice because it's short.
Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege it is to gather as believers to worship you in your house. Some of us have been worshiping you for their entire lives, and other, others have only recently come to know you. In either case, we know that it is you who has drawn us to yourself, and that we are all equal under Christ. We thank you for the church and the body of believers who share your Holy Spirit and teach and encourage us in the faith. We pray for unity at Streetlight Church so that each of us can grow in the knowledge of your Son and so we can effectively share the hope of the gospel with our family, friends, and neighbors. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing on with our teaching services, and we're now on article number 30 of the Belgic Confession, and this is about the government of the church. So we're going to read that together, and after tonight, we will likely move on to the sacraments of the church. So Belgic Confession, article number 30. And we'll probably combine 30 and 31, so I'll just read 30. And then I think we'll end up skipping 31 next week because they're closely related. So let's read Belgian Confession, Article 30 together. We believe that this true church must be governed according to the spiritual order which our Lord has taught us in his word. There should be ministers or pastors to preach the word of God and to administer the sacraments. There should also be elders and deacons who, together with the pastors, form the council of the church. By these means, they preserve the true religion. They see to it that the true doctrine takes its course, that evil men are disciplined in a spiritual way and are restrained, and also that the poor and all the afflicted are helped and comforted according to their need. By these means, everything will be done well and in good order when faithful men are chosen in agreement with the rule that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy. So we're talking there about how we should appoint pastors and elders and deacons to administer and, and govern the church. So we've been discussing the doctrine of the church in our evening teaching services. We began by noting that the church is Catholic, which means that it's made up of people from all nationalities and peoples from all across the world. We also said that the church is the body of Christ and that the church preaches the gospel, administers the sacraments, and exercises church discipline. Those were the three marks of a church, we said. Her purpose is to train each other in the gospel and spread the good news of salvation to her neighbor. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. So now that we've talked about and understand the function of the church and the character of the church, we can think about the government of the church. The government of the church has to do with how the church is organized. So we'll reflect on what the New Testament says about the government of the church Review then how the early church and medieval church governed itself. And then we'll think about Martin Luther's emphasis of the priesthood of all believers. And of course, the New Testament is going to be our most important source on this because it's the Bible, it's the Word of God. Uh, so let's pay special attention to what the New Testament says. But then we'll see how this has sort of uh, been expressed in different ways in the early church and in the medieval church uh, over the centuries. So a few weeks ago, we said that the church is the body of Christ. This means that she is one body composed of many different parts who all contribute to the mission of the church with that same spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit. In order to help the church become properly organized, we still want to be organized as a church. We don't want to be dysfunctional and, and people doing all kinds of different things. So in order to be organized, God gave us instructions about how to manage the daily affairs of the church through two special offices. And these offices are the deacons and the elders. So let's look at some passages because we can find this in the early church where they had this office of deacon and elder. So we're going to go first to Acts 6, verse 1 to 6. And Acts is about the very early church and some of the different things that happened and how the gospel spread after Jesus was ascended. So we have all kinds of little interesting details about how the early church functioned. And one of this is how deacons were assigned, and also elders. So Acts 6, verse 1 to 6. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, so that's the Greek people, arose against the Hebrews, that's the Jews. So we know the Jews were the Israelites, and the Greeks were the Hellenists. They were the, the non-Jews. 
because their widows, that's the Greek widows, were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Phrocorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So these are the first deacons that were appointed in the church, and they were to serve people in the congregation. Now we can also read about the elders being, actually we can read about elders in a whole bunch of different places, and Paul's going to use the word bishop and elder interchangeably. They mean the same thing in the New Testament. Uh, It doesn't make a difference when Paul is referring from one to the other. Uh, But we find a bunch of different places where Paul appoints elders. So let's look at one example. Acts 14. Acts 14, verse 21 to 23. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So we just find these interesting little subtle indications that when Paul went somewhere, he appointed elders. And in fact, he did that in every church, he appointed elders. So let's also turn to Acts 20, verse 17. Acts 20, verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. So again, it's sort of indirect, right? We just see that, oh, there must have been elders there. And Paul called them to discuss with them. And if we go to verse 28 now of Acts 20, we see Paul talking to them and he says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So again, there's sort of indirect, oh, there there must be elders now. And then Paul gives very direct instruction and says kind of what they do. They're overseers. And we we can glean that from the text. So we find both elders and deacons were appointed to serve the early church. And the purpose of deacons was to serve the practical needs in the congregation. We saw that, right? They were waiting on tables. They were serving people food and taking care of people's material needs. Uh, And then we also have elders who are overseers and that they should be able to teach. Now we also find very specific instructions about the character of deacons and elders. So we we don't have the Bible saying, here's exactly how you must go about appointing elders and how exactly you must go about appointing, appointing deacons. We don't have that kind of instruction. But we do have instruction about the character that these elders and deacons should have. So let's look at that. We'll go to 1 Timothy 3. And there's going to be two passages in a row here. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 7, first of all. And this is instruction to elders. And it's the character of an elder that Paul's worried about, not the exact process of how they get appointed. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace and into the snare of the devil. So we can see a list of qualities uh, that an elder should have. And then Paul goes on and talks about deacons. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, 
faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So from these lists, we learn that the offices of elder and deacon are a noble task in the church. And since the elders and deacons are servants of Christ, they ought to be especially careful to make sure that their conduct reflects Christian living. This means not giving in to drunkenness or, or greed and making it a, prior, a priority to care for their families. Now, we might also conclude when we read this list that if you want to be an elder or deacon, you have to be married because we notice in both cases that you have to only have one wife and look after your wife. But of course, this can't be right because Paul was never married. And I think we can be certain that Paul was considered an elder. And of course, Jesus also was, was never married and, and he is the, uh, you could say, the grand elder. So I don't think we need to worry about whether or not you need to be married, uh, but you do need to live a Christian life. Since elders were tasked with teaching and exhorting, Protestant churches typically recognize the minister, so Pastor Paul, for example, as an elder. So his office is elder because there is no third office as far as the New Testament says about getting a minister and an elder and a deacon. It's just elders and deacons. So Protestant churches tend to say that the minister is an elder, although he has that extra special task of preaching as well. So let's think about the early church. So just after the New Testament, right? The New Testament's our authority, but then a few decades goes by and we start to get documents from the New Testament. So what was going on then? The New Testament only prescribes the office of elder and deacon. The early church soon had three offices very early on, including elders, deacons, and bishops. So they made this distinction between an elder and a bishop. We know this because we have writings from the early church, and in those writings we find many references to these three offices. We find it over and over again. One example comes from the writings of Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius was born sometime around Jesus' death, so sometime around 35 AD, and at some point he becomes the bishop of Antioch, which was a really important city in the early church. Acts 11 tells us that Paul spent considerable uh, time teaching in Antioch, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So it was a really important center in Christianity. At the time, the Christian religion was growing in number, And the Roman officials were starting to take notice. They were starting to see this group of people coming up, banding together about these different various customs, uh, and they started to persecute the Christians. This was especially the case if a charge was brought against a Christian, and the Christian would refuse to recant their faith. So it wasn't always overt persecution, uh, but there was a rule that you couldn't be a Christian because you had to worship the emperor, and Christians didn't do that but they didn't really press the persecution unless somebody kind of ratted on you or told on you and didn't like you. And they, they would tell the, the, the officials and they would have to look into it. And if you wouldn't recount, recant, then they would have to sort of force the issue. And this went on a lot in the early church. And this might have been what happened to Ignatius because for some reason around the year 107, Ignatius was then a very elderly bishop of Antioch. He was over 70 and he was condemned to death. Military officials took Ignatius from Antioch so he could be executed at a great festival in Rome. Along the way, Ignatius wrote several letters, and we have all of them, encouraging the churches in the area. So people were able to come to Ignatius while they were doing their traveling, and they were able to talk with him. He had a scribe writing things down, so it was kind of understood that he was a prisoner and he was going to die, but he had some some liberties, and we have all these great letters. In them, Ignatius reveals that the pattern of the early church was to elect elders, deacons, and a bishop. For example, he writes, Since then, I have had the privilege of seeing you through Damas, your most worthy bishop, and through your worthy presbyters, or elders, Basis and Apollonius, and through my fellow servant, the deacon, Sotio, whose friendship may I ever enjoy, inasmuch as he is subject to the bishop, as to the grace of God, and to the elder, as to the law of Jesus Christ. So we've got three offices. This practice of appointing one bishop along with elders and deacons must have been very common by the middle of the uh, beginning of the second century because Ignatius mentions this tripartite division over and over again. In another place, he had not only mentioned these three offices, but he also indicates that the deacons were the ones that were dispensing Lord's Supper. So we find that sort of odd as Protestants, right? But the deacons were handing out Lord's Supper. So he writes, It's necessary, therefore, and such is your practice, that you do nothing without the bishop, and that you be subject also to the elder, 
as to the apostles of Jesus Christ our hope, in whom we shall be found. If we live in him, it is necessary also that the deacons, the dispensers of the sacraments of Jesus Christ, be in every way pleasing to all men. Other church fathers, such as Clement and Hippolytus, also mention these three offices. Interestingly, by the Council of Nicaea, which is convened in 325, so we talked about the Council of Nicaea a few times, that's when they dealt with the Arian controversy and Jesus' divinity, that was a really big issue, but they also dealt with the issue of deacons. So this is about 225 years after these letters are written by Ignatius. And they note, specifically, that deacons should not be handing out Lord's Supper. This is an issue that comes up at the Council of Nicaea. And so in Canon 18 of the Council, we read this. It has come to the knowledge of the Holy and Great Synod that in some districts and cities, the deacons administer the Eucharist to the elders, whereas neither canon nor custom permits that they who have no right to offer should give the body of Christ to them that do offer. And this also has been made known that certain deacons now touch the Eucharist even before the bishops, Let all such practice be utterly done away and let the deacons remain within their own bounds, knowing that they are the ministers of the bishop and the inferiors of the elders. Let them receive the Eucharist according to their order after the elders and let the bishop or the elder administer to them. So we get this constant refrain of these three offices and the deacons really shouldn't be handing out Lord's Supper according to this council, even though Ignatius saw that they were and and he said that was fine. So we see that while the New Testament only talks about the office of elder and deacon, the early church also appointed bishops. And these bishops, they were tasked not just with overseeing the church, but all of the congregations in their city. So that's how they organized this. Ignatius was the bishop, not just of the church of Antioch, but the city of Antioch, and then any other church that had fallen under his uh, his region. And just as Augustine, we all know that he's Augustine of Hippo, he was the bishop of the city of Hippo. So all the churches in Hippo are going to be under Augustine's authority. Now, this hierarchy might have been helpful uh, administratively because it helps you uh, administer things and and stay organized, but it also did lead to a very dangerous concentration of power by the bishop in Rome, which became known as the Pope. So we're going to think about that next, but any questions so far as we think about the New Testament and the early church before we talk about the Pope? Yeah, Laura? I don't know. Does anyone here know archbishops and how that falls within the categorizing? I have no idea. All I heard, like, um, my friend was archbishop, and he was, like, in his 50s. He was appointed by the church to be an archbishop. So I've been wondering, like, when... Yeah, I'm not sure. I know there's, I think, bishop, archbishop, cardinal, pope. I I think that's the hierarchy. Uh, And then also priests they have in Catholic Church, but I'm not sure. Yeah, we're just going to talk about the Pope. Yeah, no, fair enough. I think it's all these hierarchies of power that uh, the church ended up sort of uh, developing. And, and we see that right away in the early church, right already having a bishop over these others. And it's funny because Ignatius, for example, calls the bishop is like God the Father and the elders are like Jesus Christ. That's kind of how Ignatius thinks about these roles. So the bishop is like God and uh, everybody's got to fall under that hierarchy. Uh, but of course... We don't believe that anymore. Yeah, go ahead, Gordon. Uh, the yeah, we do. Oh. Yeah, so me and Eric are the elders here, and Rudolph is the deacon, and Pastor Paul is also an elder. Oh. Yeah, he's the minister and an elder. He's both. Yeah. They sat at a separate section. In some churches, they do, right? It used to be in a church I grew up in, they sat at the front of the church. But that's all tradition, right? That's all just based on how you express those things in your church. Yeah, yeah. It, that's not in the Bible. It doesn't really matter where they sit. Yeah, it matters that they oversee well and that their character is the right kind of character. And what's the difference between an elder and a deacon? Well, we were just saying, so Gordon's asking, what's the difference between an elder and a deacon? A deacon serves. So they'll do collection, for example, and they'll help people with material needs. Uh, if people have financial trouble, they'll help with things like that. Uh, where elders usually are teaching. They're teaching doctrine, and they're um, just making sure people's spiritual care is taken care of. So you can think of it as terms of material cares and spiritual cares. But there's a lot of overlap between those. Yeah. 
So let's think about the Pope. The Roman Catholic Pope has been a famous church figure for well over a thousand years. As we saw, according to the New Testament, the offices of the church are only supposed to include elders and deacons. So where did this idea of the Pope come from? This is a little bit of a complicated question, so we're just going to aim at getting at some of the couple basic factors. First, it is commonly held that the Apostle Peter did in fact visit Rome. So the Apostle Peter, uh, he was one of the 12 apostles, he visited Rome at some point, and he likely died there. Scholars agree on that. Also, the term Pope, which is just really a Greek word for father, was originally used for any respected bishop. And the Eastern Church used the term pretty loosely. So in a lot of different churches in the East, you would call the bishop of that city the Pope. And that was fine. He's kind of like the father. But in the Western Church, we come more from the Western Church, that title was usually reserved for the Bishop of Rome. Rome was the capital city. That was a really important city. So he's the only bishop in the West that they called the Pope or the Father, which again is just a Greek word uh, for Father. To understand the origination of the Pope in the modern sense, we need to reflect on the politics of Rome in the 4th and 5th centuries, so in the 400s and the 500s. You might remember that the Christians endured persecution during the 4th century under, uh, until Constantine became the emperor of Rome. If you remember Constantine, he solidified things and he became the emperor. At the time, Rome was split into a bunch of various different empires, and Constantine consolidated these by defeating other Roman rulers, including his brother-in-law. Eventually, Constantine managed to conquer the entire region, including the eastern part of Rome. Constantine decided he was going to move the capital city of the empire from Rome to the east. So he built a city called Constantinople, and today this is called Istanbul. Because of this, there were essentially two capital cities now. And Rome is a really old city, right? They've had a lot of really famous people there and philosophers and thinkers and democracy and all these things and Caesars. And suddenly Constantine decides to move the capital after maybe 600 years of it being there or longer. So it was kind of a big thing at the time. So now you've got two capitals. You've got Rome in the west and Constantinople in the east. And Constantine made Constantinople the capital. He, he lived there. And this made the eastern city more powerful at some point than Rome. Also, because Constantine favored Christianity, the bishops of Constantinople and in the East in general became more influential than the bishops in the West and of Rome. In fact, for many centuries, there's going to be a competition between Eastern and Western bishops. They're going to be constantly sort of vying for power and influence. And the Eastern church is the more influential church until at least 8 or 900 AD. So Eastern Orthodox, we don't even really know about them very much. We don't see those churches very often but they were the carriers of theology and the influencers in the church for the first thousand years, uh, almost. And partly that's because of Constantine and Constantinople. Eventually, Constantine died, and the city of Rome went into decline. It was being attacked by various different groups, and none of the politicians were properly defending the city. As this happened, church leaders, and especially the bishop of Rome, filled that vacuum by taking on a leadership role to protect the city when government officials failed their duty. So, for example, Leo the Great was the bishop of Rome uh, from 440 to 461. During his time, Italy was attacked by the barbarian Attila. And as the army made their way to Rome, since there was no politicians willing to defend the city, Bishop Leo marched out to meet him. So you've got the barbarians attacking Rome. The city's been around for a long time, centuries. And now it's starting to fall to these people who are attacking it. And it's the Pope who's going out to meet them and defend the city, not the politicians, which is completely different uh, than how it had ever been. For whatever reason, this barbarian, Attila, decides not to attack Rome. He moves north instead, and he dies shortly after. A few years later, Vandals again attack the city, and they did sack it, and they did take Rome. But Leo met with them as well, and he negotiated with them, and he had them not burn down the city. Uh, and, and Leo believed it was because he had negotiated with these vandals. These episodes gave Bishop Leo great authority and influence in the city. Given Leo's success, he personally became convinced that Jesus had made Peter and his successors the rock on which the church was to be built. This is what Leo started to think. He argued that, therefore, the bishop of Rome, because that's Peter's direct successor, he's the head of the church. And thus, Leo's political influence and arguments laid the groundwork for the rise of the office of the Pope as we know it today. So for centuries, the Bishop of Rome 
they're going to rely on these arguments that were first crafted by Leo, uh, and they're going to make their case for the papacy over and over and over again uh, because he was influential. He sort of filled that power vacuum, uh, and he crafted these arguments thinking that Jesus had put him as uh, the, the head of the church. And that's kind of the basic idea of where the papacy came from. So let's turn real quick to Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20, and we'll see what scripture has to say about this. Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20. And we've read this passage already, but we'll read it again. So Pope Leo is saying, I'm the head of the church. Let's see what Colossians says. He, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's Jesus Christ. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the church or head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So we see as Christians, we believe that Christ is the head of the church. And while we can't see him with our eyes, we believe he reigns in heaven invisibly, his spirits enter our hearts so that we display Christ uh, and, and he is the head of the church. So this idea of uh, the papacy, I think, is not something we need to, uh, to hold to uh, because it's not in scripture. Any questions about the Pope before we get to the final section? Yeah, Josh? Was there a distinction between Catholics and Protestants back then? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were a big force in history and the moving of the map. Yeah, so there are the, the 600s, I believe, is when Muhammad invents Islam. And they become, uh, they attack various different regions. And they are especially hard in the East. They're especially hard in the East. And that is partly why the Eastern Church sort of crumbled. Because the Muslims took over and, uh, and they, were, they were pretty brutal. Yeah. And so the popes are kind of helping each other, right, in the East and in the West. And the, the Muslims play a, an interesting role in all that history. Yeah. Yeah, Laura? I forgot. How did the Jehovah Witnesses first form? <laughs> well, that's in the 1800s. <laughs> okay. Right? And that's Joseph Smith, and that's the Protestants fighting with each other uh, about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he can't figure out what's going on, so he just kind of makes up his own thing. <laughs> yeah. Say your question louder, Gordon. Do we pray for the Pope? Do we pray for the Pope? Yes. What do you think? Are you, should we pray for the Pope? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, what do you think? Do you think we should? As uh, Catholic, yeah. Pope's yeah, yeah. I think we absolutely should pray for the Pope. Yeah, I mean, we should pray for anybody, right? The Bible says we should pray even for our enemy. Uh, but I wouldn't see the Pope as our enemy. Uh, he is the, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. And those are our brothers and sisters, and we should certainly pray for him that he would be wise and govern well. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of having a hierarchy in the church we see comes very early, right? This is in the. So when you talk to your Roman Catholic friends, they've got tradition hugely on their side to say, we've got this hierarchy of bishops. This comes from the first century, the second century. Of course, they're going to think that's the case. And same within the East, right? They have this same hierarchy, uh, and you can understand why. They have tradition on, on their side. But when we read scripture and we analyze that, we say, okay, we can love our brothers and sisters that are Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox and maybe debate them, but we don't have to have popes and bishops because we don't see that in scripture. So we're not, we're not bound to that. Okay, let's just think finally about Martin Luther. So eventually the church in the East, which we just kind of said, lost its position of influence while the church in the West, and especially the Pope, became the most powerful political entity in the world. By 800 AD, it was the Pope of Rome who endorsed the office of the Roman Emperor Charlemagne by placing the crown on his head. So when the next big emperor came to power, the Pope is endorsing that and saying, yes, I give you my blessing. I'm putting the crown on your head. 
So we can see that the church and the Pope especially is entrenched in politics by the year 800. Uh, the way any sort of president you see on TV today or anybody else, the Pope's right in there and he's probably the most powerful guy on that list. When we reach Martin Luther in the 16th century, the power and prestige of the papacy has become really corrupt. So we know that indulgences were being exacted, right? The church owned all kinds of land, and this power sort of corrupted the leadership in the church. Uh, if you read a church history book, it's really interesting to read about the popes, but at some point they start assassinating each other and killing kings and sending armies against other places, and it really doesn't seem anything like Christianity uh, as you read it in the Bible, and, and this was going on for, for a long time. So it's a, it's, the papacy is strange. So Rome, uh, uh, Martin Luther, of course, is a Roman Catholic, and he's studying scripture, and he's seeing, wait, what's, what I'm seeing and what I'm seeing in the hierarchy of the church and what I'm seeing in scripture is not really aligning. So that's why when Luther writes a biblical critique against indulgences and the Pope, so Luther looked at the Bible, he looked at indulgences in the Pope and said, wait, this isn't scriptural. So he wrote that out in the 95 Thesis. He signed that on the Wittenberg door, and he basically signed his own death warrant because he just said to everybody, the Pope's not real, and that's what the Bible says. After centuries of power and corruption in terms of church hierarchy, Luther went back to scripture, and he recognized that Jesus is the head of the church. There's no hierarchy among believers. Of course, the Pope did not appreciate Luther's critique, and when Luther would not recant, the wheels were in motion for a formal protest. And again, uh, that's where we get this idea of Protestants, right? There was a protest against the Catholic Church. One of Luther's most endearing insights is his notion of the priesthood of all believers. This was a really important thing for Martin Luther. He writes about it all the time. Scholars always talk about it. Luther reminded us that the spiritual matters are not reserved for popes, priests, and bishops because all believers are called to a new spiritual life through Jesus Christ. And this was completely radical at the time. It's hard for us to imagine, right? The laity was seen as just sort of the material estate and the bishops and the priests, they were the spiritual estate. And that's what the church said to you. They said, we're the spiritual ones, you're not. You must listen to us. Uh, and so this idea of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ was kind of foreign at the time and people longed for it. And Luther helps to sort of bring this out, but it comes out more and more over the next couple centuries. And now today we always talk about as evangelicals this idea of a personal relationship with Christ. So in letters, uh, uh, um, Luther's letter to the Christian nobility, he writes this. It's pure invention that Pope, Bishop, priests, and monks are to be called the spiritual estate. This is indeed a fine bit of lying and hypocrisy. Yet one should not be frightened by it. For all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate, and there is among them no difference at all but that of office. But that a pope or a bishop anoints, confers tonsors, ordains, cons consecrates, or prescribes dress unlike that of the laity, this may make hypocrites, but it never makes a Christian or a spiritual man. Luther's point is that all Christians are equal under Christ. What makes someone a Christian is not his or her position in the church, but knowledge of one's sin, repentance before God, and faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ and the renewal of the Holy Spirit guarantees equality among all believers. As we've been saying all along, salvation is a gift of grace, so we bring nothing before Christ. In the end, the offices of elder and deacon are roles of oversight and service, not power and dominion. So let's conclude. I'm going to read from 1 Peter 2, verse 1 to 12, and that'll be our concluding remark. And this is a pas passage about the priesthood of all believers. 1 Peter 2, verse 1 to 12. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, 
The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passage of the, of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they s- speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Any questions at all about Martin Luther and the priesthood of all believers? Yeah. Do I think it's a good thing or a bad thing, do you mean? Yeah. Or? yeah, do you think it's a good thing when the church and the state are heavily linked to each other, or does it create problems? Or? Yeah, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> I mean, it can cause all... Oh, he's wondering if uh, church and state used to be very tied together. Church and state were very linked, and they're not really anymore in Canada. So is that a good thing or a bad thing, right, is kind of what we're thinking. What, what does that mean? Yeah, it's an interesting question and a difficult one. As Christians, we want to think certainly about the fact that all things are under God's domain, right? Jesus Christ is the head of this world. He created the universe. He created us. So everything should come under the lens of Christianity. It's God's world. That's the way it is. So this idea of, let's say, secularism, right? We're going to be a secular country. So we're going to include all religions. This is a neutral ground, right? We're neutral. That's not true. There is no neutral ground. You're always taking a position from some angle. So this idea of neutrality, I don't think works. And so as Christians, we should speak into secular culture. Should we get connected in with the governments like they were back in the day? I don't know about that. Yeah, Christians should serve in governments and bring their Christian influence. But do you need to, you don't, definitely don't want a, a kind of top-down Christianity because that doesn't work either. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. What are your thoughts on secularism? Well, I, just, I just think that uh, in the past, when the church and the state were linked together, it created good morality for the people, but then it seemed because of sin that the state or the church often took advantage, I guess, so to speak, and kind of abused the power. I like the idea that you had mentioned that it's nice when there's Christians that are in government that use their influence. Yes. For how they govern the people. In the times that countries, when the governments respect the, um, the commands of God, it's times when things are good for the people. Yeah. And I think that's right. You know, it is God's world. His commands do stand fast. They're not changing. And if we obey them as a country, we're going to do well. That's what the Bible promises. But there is always a slippery slope of power and being corrupted. So it's challenging. The early church certainly grew really well when they were under persecution. That's when the church grew. That's when it flourished. That's when people said, I want to be a Christian. Um, But that doesn't always hold because in the East, the church died because they were persecuted so hard by the Muslims, right? So you kind of think there's this romanticism about being persecuted, but in the East, that was not a good thing in the long run. Yeah. Good question, though. I think these guys are sorting it out back there. You just trying to get the door open, Janelle? It should just push open. Did you have a question too, Betty?
Yeah, we should be grateful for our freedom, you said, but you don't see your great-grandchildren growing up in a religious country or, or even a free country. Yeah. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so we need Christians to be in those leadership positions, I think. Christians should be the judges and the lawyers and the politicians, absolutely. They should be in the culture, being part of the culture and just helping make culture. Uh, and that's, that's what Christians should be doing. Apparently, Roman Catholics are really good at that. They are the judges, right? If you look at the Supreme Court, those are Roman Catholics. Somehow they have that in their DNA a little bit more than evangelicals do. Um, evangelicals tend to, or Protestants anyway, sort of go with the flow of the culture, right? We won't pu- push back on it. We'll say, yeah, bring that in the church too. And we kind of get watered down, and that happens to Protestants, but not Catholics. They're usually good at pushing away. So it's, it's difficult stuff. Yeah. Great. Did you have some, Laura? Praising Mary. Well, we talked about that a little bit a couple weeks ago. I don't think we'll get into that tonight. I'm not fully educated on it. Um, okay. Yeah, so we'll have to leave that off for another time. Yeah. Okay, let's move on, and we will together profess our faith and by singing the Apostles' Creed, hymn one. Okay, we're going to have our offering, and we'll do our offering song, and then we're going to have our community prayer.
I just want to um, say one more thing about the secular government, because I think it's such a great and timely point. We're talking about government and church and state and the combination. And in Canada, our government has become secular. We're in a secular country. I think it's really important for Christians to realize that secularism is not neutral. I just can't stress it enough. That's how it presents itself, right? Secularism says, if you subtract religion and Christianity, you'll get secularism. And it's the middle, right? It's the middle. It's the neutral ground. It's totally false. There's, there's no such thing. Everybody's coming at things from a perspective. So if you have a Muslim-run government, it's gonna be, there's going to be executions and there's going to be 99 lashes. We just met somebody last night who was a Muslim. He got arrested in his country at 38 years old and he got 99 lashes. That's, that's the punishment. That's how they govern things. If you're in a Christian country, it's going to be governed a certain way. If you're in a secular country, there is no God. That's the idea. There is no God. We can't talk about God. So you're going to have uh, abortion. You're going to have euthanasia. You're going to have the value of life brought down. Things like sexuality and pleasure emphasized because this is the only life there is. So as Christians, we need to be really careful not to think that secularism is neutral. It's not, and it's a worldview. Uh, we want things to be from a Christian perspective. Of course, we're not going to force it because that's not how Christians do things, right? Secular governments are making laws now around sexuality. Christians don't approach things that way. We should do things in love and in kindness and in grace. So we should be cautious in this country because changes are happening and uh, we need to be aware of those changes. So it's time for community prayer. Is there any prayer requests? We'll take a couple. Yeah, Laura? Laura? Great. We will pray for uh, Kevin and we'll praise God for that. Uh, anybody else? Prayer requests? So also I should point out that um, Pete's sister passed away. Uh, Pete and Sheila, Pete Campshire, his sister passed away. Janet, it was expected. She had cancer um, and she's home with the Lord now is what Pete said. He's, he's okay with it. But we'll pray for comfort for that family as well. She had, she had children. I don't think she was married though. She did. She, she passed away today. Yeah. Great. Let's come before God. In a hey, John. Hey, Sarah. Is he good? Yeah, I did. I did. Okay. Thank you. Let's come before God in a word of prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Lord God, we come before you and we thank you that we could gather here and that we can discuss your word. We thank you, Lord, for the church and we thank you for scripture and for the authority that we find there. We thank you, Lord, for the elders and deacons and the preachers who administer and who have oversight. But we also thank you, Lord, that all believers are equal, that we are all supposed to serve and to love one another the way that you loved us. We pray that you give us your Holy Spirit, that you build us up, Help us to see that we are the priesthood of believers because of Jesus Christ, that we can live out that gospel in our lives. We also pray, Lord, for uh, people in the congregation. We think of Pete and Sheila. Uh, we pray that you give them comfort now that uh, Peter's sister, Janet, has passed away. We pray that you bring comfort also to her children uh, who are still here. And we also pray, Lord, for Kevin. We thank you that his uh, surgery has gone well, and we pray that you'll continue to bring a recovery to him and we pray for Laura as she uh, ministers to him and to those around her as well. We thank you, Lord God, that you are our God and our Father. We pray that you be with us uh, into the week ahead and that you give us wisdom and courage uh, to see that we are equal in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our last song is hymn 8, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow.
receive God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.